I don't know. Y'all been y'all y'all been putting up with me for a year, so y'all know I'm kind of odd. I want to read the whole book, all right? And then I want to come to you and <clears throat> and give you what I got from the book. <clears throat> I can tell you two things about the sermon today. The outline is not original with me. The sermon is something the Lord gave me. Now, that may sound crazy to you, but it is. <clears throat> Let me tell you some things. Basically, this was a very sad season in the course of time for the children of Israel. This is a post-exilic book, okay? That's a big $2 phrase, which means they've already spent that 69 years or whatever in uh, captivity in another man's land, and God has allowed them to come back. This is uh, <clears throat> parallel and yet probably a little bit after the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Ezra came back and built the temple. Uh, Nehemiah came back and built the wall. And this is some point after that because Malachi is preaching from that temple, okay? So this is this is the last, we, we know, you know from looking at your book, this, this is the last book before the uh, Gospels. This is uh, maybe something you don't know, and maybe you do, I don't know, but just to be sure, this is like the last word from God before John the Baptist shows up, okay? It's 400 years of silence where they're just groping along in the darkness, okay? But I think if, if we read this today, you're going to see a close correlation between what they were facing and what we face in these United States of America. It is a very sad season of time, and yet this is, as I said last night or yesterday in the text, it is a caution to the lost. It's a caution to the lagging saint. But it is a consolation to the leading saints, the loving saints, those people that, that really, truly desire on a daily basis to be used of God. There's a lot of consolation in this book. Consolation, console, to make us feel better, to encourage us. So I want us to look at it. I want to see the, the correlation. I want to read it. It's, uh, you say read a whole book of the Bible. It's only four chapters. It's really not that long. It's three pages in my Bible. I want to read it, and then I want to go back through it together and Lord willing, we can do that in about 30 minutes. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Verse 6, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then, if then I be your father, where's my honor? If I be a master, where's my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priests that despise my name, ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible, and ye offer the blind for sacrifice. Is it not evil? If ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now, I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been your means, by your means. Will he regard persons, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down there of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name in pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say the the table of the Lord is polluted. The fruit thereof, even as meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it. And ye have snuffed at it. That's like, you know, when my boys let out their breath and I give them a command, I get pretty frustrated with that. 
Okay? And that's basically what the Lord's saying that his people are doing to him. He's giving them something to do, and they snuff at it as if it has nothing to do with it. Ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. Ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick, that ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver which have in his flock a male, and voweth, and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. And now, O ye priest, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, if ye will not lay it to heart, and give to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you. <clears throat> this my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace. I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye, this is what you should be, and now we get to what? what he says his people are. Ye are departed out of the way. You've caused many to stumble at my law. So not only are they not doing what they should, but they're causing other people to not do what they should. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacle of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done. Again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Why is the Lord not hearing us? Why is the Lord not listening to our prayers? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit? Wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of thy youth. He's talking about they were, there was great numbers of divorces in that day. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, Wherein have we wearied him? When you say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, where is the God of judgment? We can look around and we can see preachers. They're not necessarily saying that drug dealer's good and that preacher's evil, but they are glorifying things and twisting Scripture to say certain things are good when the Scripture clearly says those things are evil. That's what he's saying here. In Chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord, <clears throat> whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant to the Lord as one in the days of old and as of former years. So he's basically talking about God's going to send judgment. That judgment's going to cause a revival to come forth from the Lord and then he will 
uh, enjoy our worship. Verse 5, and I will come to you, I will come near to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerer and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless that turn aside the stranger from his right and Fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. If you if you think about that, that verse right there, and I'm going to continue reading in just a second, but I'm trying to make a correlation. You think about that. One of the what somebody pointed out to me this week had no idea what I was studying. They pointed out this week one of the largest companies in in the U.S. In fact, one of the largest companies in the world that the the, the family that owns it are billionaires, and yet the majority of their employees are are on food stamps. The majority of their employees are on Medicaid. So you see here how the turning against the poor, God has never liked that. Uh, witness against the adulterers, false swearers. I mean, how many times do we have people in church look at us and tell us something that we know is an absolute falsehood and they say it with such conviction god says he doesn't like that they oppress the hireling in his wages if i'm a billionaire and i got somebody that's working for me and they're so poor they have to have the government ins the, the worst of the government insurance and in food stamps i'm doing something wrong and yet this family declares themselves to be christian right verse six let's go on trying to see a correlation between what's historically happening here and what is currently happening for us verse six one of my favorite verses in scripture for i am the lord i change not therefore ye sons of jacob are not consumed my my lord is changeless and that's why he extends mercy to us. Verse 7, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed God in tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room to receive it, enough to receive it. So God's fussing at him, and yet he's saying, if you'll do half of what you're not doing, I'm going to bless you. Look in verse uh, 11. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be delightsome, a, de a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit it is is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise. I love that that term, that name for Christ, the Son, S-U-N of righteousness, uh, shall arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. How does a calf in the stall grow up? Fat and happy. Fat and happy. Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto you in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let's pray again. I'm going to ask Brother Charles to pray over that.
I'm kind of tossed between throwing my notes away and leaning heavily on my notes. But I think one thing for sure that we can see from this scripture is there is a strong correlation between what was happening in the land of Israel and what is happening now in this country. There's a strong correlation in that they, they made a, a show, went through the motions, if you will, of serving God, and yet they were truly trusting in other things. I think that's very true here. The, the priests were insensitive and, and, and the politicians were insane. I, I think we can see that in today's world, right? It, it doesn't take a, a real sharp guy to look and see if the Democrats are for it, the Republicans are against it, and if the Republicans are for it, then the Democrats are against it, and the Independents are against all of them, and there's just no sense there. And it's easy when we talk about the priest. <clears throat> Charles, turn to Jeremiah 531 for me. <clears throat> when we talk about the priest, it's easy to point to some of these big televangelists that we see and, and see how they twist the Word of God, okay? It's like they take the Word of God, and it's still the Word of God, but they twist it and make it say something that God never intended to say it. And yet, while it's easy to point to these people that have some sort of a national or international platform, um, some men, some women who claim to be preachers who are truly not preaching the Word of God, if we're honest, it's real easy to look and see local people that are doing those same things. Are you there, Charles? I, I believe so. It should talk about priests, prophets, and people. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rules by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what we be doing in their So that is what, when I look out at the world today, 80 some odd percent of our country still professes to be Christian and yet where's the Christianity? You know, Bo said something at the dinner table last night about back-to-back -back world war champs. Well, that's true. This country is, if you will, back-to-back -back world war champs. But my mama was born the year the war was over. She's 72 years old. Where's our glory been since then? Came back a little bit in Reagan's day. But name me a general from today. That, I read some stuff about this to you recently about Patton during the Battle of the Bulge kneeling down in a church and speaking to the Lord and saying, I can't help but feel that I have offended you because it's not going our way. Show me where I'm wrong, Lord. If you'll give me four days of good weather, I will present Germany to you as a, as a Christmas present to your son. Where's the, where's the, even though a lot of our politicians profess to be Christian, where's the politician that's, that's kneeling down and publicly crying out for God to work in his life so that he can do something great for God? Where is the politician doing that? Where's the preacher, where are the preachers doing that? But what did the verse say? The prophets prophesy falsely. So there are preachers, Michael, who are taking God's word and making it say things it doesn't say. The priests bear rules by bear rule by their own means. So the priests were ruling the country and they're just doing what seems fit to them. But then the problem comes back to the people. We like it that way. We need a revival. A revival is not John Harvey can't bring revival in his suitcase when he comes. I'm supposed to preach a revival for him next month. I can't take revival down there. Where does revival come from? Yes, ma'am. That's right. It comes down from the Lord. Revival, if revival hits us, it's going to affect us. I've said this several times lately, but I like it, and you're going to hear it for a while yet, I feel sure. It's going to affect us vertically. Not only will we not be able to make it through the week without corporate worship, but I don't believe if we truly have revival, we're not going to be able to make it through the day without individual worship. Christ is going to become center place in our lives if we truly have a revival. Souls being saved is not revival. Souls being saved is the fruit of revival. Revival is Christ becomes center place in my life. He's on the throne of my heart. He is all important to me. And then 
horizontally, Christ did it vertically, horizontally, if he's really that center place in my life, I won't be able to stop from talking to people about him. And that's when the souls will be saved. What can we see here in the text about today that's encouraging to us? I told you that it would be something encouraging to us. Is it a bad day? Look here in the text. In the first chapter there, uh, the burden of the word of the Lord. Why is, it, why is the word of the Lord a burden? Because the word of the Lord is a burden, whether it be to me as the preacher or to you as a Christian, uh, <clears throat> It should be a burden, but I think we, we take this too lightly. But the souls, lives, eternal and temporal, hang in the balances with how we live it and how we speak it. So it should be a burden for us to look around and see the people around us and know what we know. And it should, it should be a great burden on us as to how we're going to share it and how I'm going to live it so that they will come to Christ. Look here. All these other people saying what they're going to do for God. And God says, I'm going to do this so I'm going to be magnified. He says, uh, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If I'm your father, where's my servant? He goes on and talks about, uh, in the next chapter, about divorce. Look, there's two things I want you to get from this. And then I'm going to give you my first point. Where are our tears for the people? I had Charles read a verse. Jerry, would you turn to uh, Psalm 126? I want you to read verses 5 and 6. Where are our tears for the lost around us? This is how I submit to you that we, including me, are going through the motions because we have no tears for the lost around us. Let me know when you're there, Brother Jerry. The, 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 the next chapter talked about divorce. You could be divorced by a spouse. You could be forsaken by a parent, forgotten by your friends. But the Lord's the caring one. That's what we see in verse number two there. I have loved you. Well, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Why are you born again? The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And the Bible says, I've told you this for the year I've been here, it's not our doctrine, though I think doctrine is terribly important. It is not our denomination, though I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die I'll be Baptist dead. It is not my dress, though I wear a suit every time I preach the gospel, unless I'm preaching to the football team or the baseball team. It is my demeanor. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love one toward another. Are you there? Read that for me. His sheaves. You, you sow a seed and it brings forth a, a stalk. I, I like to use corn because I understand corn better. The corn... Uh, it, it might be a bad year and you have a nubbin with just one or two uh, kernels on it. It might be a good year and you have three years on there and all these. But a sheave, Jake, is several stalks wrapped up together. But that verse is good as says, no weeping, no reaping. He's the caring one. He cares for us. But that care for us, we, we, we take it for granted and we don't share it enough. He's the caring one, but we need to be a channel to let that light and love show forth to our community. Not just the community here at Bethlehem. Yeah, sure. But Amory, Smithville, Tremont. I mean, y'all got people all over. Y'all got people in Florida all around. He's the caring one. He's never going to... It's a sad state of affairs. But the Lord is the caring one. Look at the, the end of, of chapter 1 there, verse 14. And it says it again there 
in the beginning of the, the second chapter there. But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth, and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. And he says that again in the first part of chapter 2 there, though I can't put my eyes on it at a moment. Not only is Christ the caring one, but he is the crowned one. He was crowned in mockery at, at Calvary, right? I mean, he was, he was whipped, and, and we don't understand that whipping. We think of the whipping we got from our daddies. And, and I know that there was a couple of times when, when my daddy finished whipping me, I almost got a second whipping for not standing still for him to put methylate on them stripes on my legs because that methylate burned as bad as the whipping did, and I didn't want it. But the whipping he got, CJ, compares nothing to that. Nothing. Not even to the one Bo got for jumping on the back of a moving vehicle that was in reverse. It doesn't compare to that. People who took that whipping often had their entrails around their ankles when it was done because that whip would rip the stomach open. He took that whipping for us. The Bible says that he was whipped so bad. They, they, even, even the movie that was rated R that depicted the crucifixion didn't do justice. It was rated R because of the violence, right? It didn't do justice to the whipping that he took because the Bible says that his visage, his face was so marred, he couldn't be recognized as a man. And they put that crown of thorn, thorns on his head. And that, that hurts. We've all been pricked by a thorn. Can you imagine these thorns? And then they take a reed and drive it down on there. And I don't know if you've ever seen. I know that Marlon has done some traveling. And thorns around here, they're usually about yay big, right? I've seen some thorns in West Africa there, Marlon. They, they're about two inches long. And when you, when you wind them up like that and let them dry, they feel as hard as nails. Can you imagine that pointy spike being driven into his skull? He was crowned in mockery, but right now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's crowned in majesty. And according to Revelation 19, he will come back crowned mightily. He's the crowned one. We serve a great God. He's the caring one. He's the crowned one. But look in... Uh, Chapter, chapter uh, 3 there, verse 6. I said it was one of my favorite verses in Scripture. We're talking about seas here. He's the, carry, he's the carrying one. He's the crowned one. What do you think we're going to get from verse 6 right there? I'm the Lord thy God. I change not. He's the changeless one. Let, let me tell you some things that, that haven't changed about him. <clears throat> He's saying, I am Jehovah. I'm the self-existent one. I'm the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. You don't give me anything just like we don't crown him. We submit to whom he is. We don't give him his glory. We submit to his glory. We are simply thankful for whom he is. He changes not. What is, how, how do we get that out of the Bible? The Bible says twice in Hebrews chapter 6, immutable. He doesn't change. Webster's defines that as not having the ability to change. I believe the word that it's translated from just means change less. Okay? I'm thankful for that. What hasn't changed about him? His precepts haven't changed. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. I, I committed it to memory years ago. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in an earthen furnace, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The Bible says in another place, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. His precepts haven't changed. His program hasn't changed. What's his program? He sent preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher to the children of Israel. The New Testament all powers given in me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Preachers, preach the gospel to every creature. Mark. 
Repentance and remission of sin preached in his name, Luke. As my Father sent me, so send I you, John. Ye shall be witnesses of these things, Acts. Ye are ambassadors, First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. His purpose had not changed. His program hasn't changed. Excuse me, his precepts haven't changed. His program hasn't changed, and his purpose had not changed. What's his purpose? Why did he come? You tell me. Why did he come to earth? To pay for our sins. The Bible says he's not willing that any should pay. I don't care what some other person may tell you from God's word and, and twist some portion of scripture to say everybody can't be saved. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says that the salvation hath appeared to all, but the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God wants everybody to be saved. His purpose haven't, hasn't changed. We don't, I, the, why is that important? Why is that important? Uh, I, I heard someone recently talk about their new boss was bipolar. One day he says this, and the next day he says that. And if you do that, then you're in trouble because you broke this. And if you do this, you're in trouble because you broke that. He's bipolar, Jake. You can't make him happy. We don't serve a bipolar God. We serve a God who is changeless. If it was yesterday we needed to be in his word, and then we needed to be... Uh, praising him daily and worshiping him daily and having our walk be as good as our words in witnessing to other people, then the same thing is true today. He is the caring one. I don't know what Michael's going through. Uh, Denise and I met somebody on the on a walking trail yesterday, and she wanted to know who the child was that we met. And I tried to explain uh, some crazy things about the child. And she said, you don't know what that child has gone through. And I said, boy, you're right. I don't understand what that child has been through to make her do the things that she's done. I don't understand. Y'all have met a child who's uh, vandalized this building. We don't understand what's going on in that child's heart and life to make her want to vandalize God's house. We don't understand that. But God hadn't changed. He's not willing for her to perish any more than he is for anyone else to perish. He's the caring one. <laughs> Woo, I'm glad he cares for me. <laughs> I've never had to stand quite like Paul where no man stood with me because I've always, at the worst point in my life, I've had Denise in my camp. Never had to stand like Paul where no man stood with me. But God, is, Jesus is the caring one. He's the crowned one. He's the changeless one. Look, <clears throat> the end of the chapter there. Verses 17, 18. They shall be mine, saith the Lord. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth me. He's the claiming one. Look, it's a sure claim. We, we don't have to worry about Am I saved or am I not saved? Why? Because it, th th this book, his precepts haven't changed. And his book tells us how to know beyond any doubt that we are saved. These things have I written unto you, believe that you may, that believe that you may know that you have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13 says. What things? That we love the brethren, that we keep the commandments, that we're led by the Spirit. We can look into the mirror of our daily lives and know that we're saved. It is a sure claim. The Bible says, I'm in his hand and no man can pluck me out. That, that no man includes me. I'm in, it is a sure claim. I couldn't lose my salvation, Jake, if I wanted to. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. He's the claiming one. It's a sure claim. It's a speedy claim. The Bible says in first, uh, let's just turn over there to First Thessalonians chapter four and read that. My thirty minutes is up, so bear with me, and I'll try to hurry up. First Corinthians chapter four. First Thessalonians. Thank you. First Thessalonians chapter four. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. This has a lot to do, by the way, with why the funeral the other day was not a really a mourning service, but a, a, a celebration, okay? I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as other which have no hope. You go to a lost funeral. 
Go to a funeral where they don't know what tomorrow brings for their loved one because they didn't know Christ or because nobody in the family knows Christ. Denise has been to a, a funeral in her family where half the family was saved and half the family was, wasn't. And there was a great difference in their reaction. They sorrowed because they had no hope. They knew they'd never see him again. But we don't sorrow like that. Why? Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So it's not Paul's opinion. It's the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We won't come before them. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort ye one another with this so it is it's a sure claim it is a speedy claim it's a specific claim if you're not his speedy I think 1 Corinthians 15 52 talks about in the twinkling of an eye a twinkling is much quicker than a blink I won't bore you with the details but let's get back to us for just a second we, we could be there's much caution to the, to the lagging saint because he hasn't changed and he is coming again and yet there's consolation for us if we're saved whether we're where we need to be with Christ or not there's still consolation in this because he's the caring one he's the claiming one he's the changeless one but clearly we try to draw lines and, and divisions and and I don't care what camp you're in as believers. I know what camp we're in. But because of some extended family, I've been kind of looking at other camps uh, recently and kind of seeing what's going on there. And basically the same thing goes on in every camp of believers. We go about, Michael, trying to establish our own righteousness of how great we are and how terrible everybody else is. But if we look into the mirror of God's Word, we all need to be closer to Christ. Okay? I said, man, you sure are beating up on us this morning. The Lord's been beating on me all week. It's your turn. Amen. What's the answer? He's the caring one. <laughs> Ooh, he's the crowned one. He's the changeless one. He's the claiming one. He's the curing one. Look in that last there. Verse 2 of chapter 4. But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. <laughs> and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under your soles of your feet, that the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. <laughs> Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. When we're trying to do everything ourselves, we get all burdened down. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I struggle with... with, with Poor little me. I struggle with, well, why is it not going better? And you know what I have to wake up and see, Clarence? I have to wake up and see Dad's trying to do everything in his power instead of God's power. And when I catch myself being inconsistent in my Christian life, it's not God's fault. It's not the church's fault. It's not my friend's fault. Whose fault is it? It's my fault. Well, what's the answer? I have the sin. I have the disease called sin. And you say, well, I thought you were saved. I am. But you might say I'm two-thirds saved, Miss Karen. My soul is saved. My spirit is saved. But my old flesh is wicked. And it won't be, that won't be changed until I get that new body. Whether it be by rapture or by my glorified body meeting my soul from heaven. I won't be 100% saved, if you will, all three parts of my being saved until him. The Apostle Paul said, that I would, I do not, and what I would not, that I do. If the Apostle Paul struggled with his flesh, I know John Stuart Hallman's going to. The cure for that sin is daily submission to Jesus Christ. The cure for that sin is calling on him. What's the Bible say? If we pretend we don't have sin... He'll take care of us. Is that what it says? 
If we pretend everything's hunky-dory and we go through the motions and we go to church and we give a little bit of money here and we give a little bit of money there, then everything's going to be okay. If I open my Bible once a day, I'm going to be okay. Is that is what, No, it says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As I understand things, Michael, that means that I'm not just going to confess it but I'm going to turn away from it, and I'm going to say, Lord, it's yours. And it may be something in our lives, Michael, where we turn away from it, and then somehow, without even realizing it, we've kind of reached and put it back in our pocket and carried it with us. And we have to repent of some things over and over and over. I think that's why the Bible says in Hebrews, the sin that does so easily beset us. One person may have some sin that they just can't get away from, and we look at that sin and go, I don't understand that. You know, I, I told y'all before I got saved, I drank enough whiskey to float a battleship around. But when I got saved, I put it down and I walked away from it. I don't understand people that can't walk away from it. But maybe you don't understand how a fella can't walk away from the table and he keeps struggling with eating too much. Everybody has their own besetting sin, but the same cure. It may be different diseases, Michael, where if we're talking about physical diseases, blood pressure, well, this guy has to take... Lotrol for his blood pressure. This guy has to take amlodipine for his blood pressure. This guy has to take low tensin for his blood Whatever. But when he comes to the disease of sin, it don't matter what sin you're struggling with this morning. There's one cure, and his name is the Son of Righteousness. His name is Jesus of Christ. And if we come to him, he stands with open arms ready to hold us tight and forgive us of that sin. And not only take away the sin, but take away the guilt. I'm going to shut up now. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the